All right, so seagulls are a type of seabird. And you will see seagulls all year, right? And they can be very annoying, actually, if you go to the beach, um, because they literally eat everything, including your lunch, if you leave your lunch out. So they will eat everything. Um, we say that they're probably the type of bird that is best adapted to life with humans, because they can eat pretty much anything that we uh, don't want, or they get in the trash can, right? And they eat everything out of the trash can. Um, and so they they can be very annoying, but they're well adapted to life with humans. Uh, gulls live closer to shore, okay? So they actually don't go too far out into the ocean. Um, so seagulls stick close to land. Um, and actually back in the day when sailors were, were trying to find land, you know, coming to the new world, um, one of the indications that they were close to land was that they would see a seagull, right? Because seagulls don't go too far away from, from land. So if you see a seagull, then that means that you are close to land. Um, interesting, fun little fact, the California gull is actually the state bird of Utah. And Why? you're like, huh? Why? What? What's going on? Well, um, weird, but there, back in like 1848, people were trying to settle in the West, right? So people were trying to build settlements and tame the wild West. Well, there were people in Utah that were trying to settle down, and um, they didn't have enough food to last the winter. It was the middle of winter and they were starving. Um, and so they're like praying, like, oh, we need food. And so they wake up the next day and there's a huge flock of California gulls on the lake. Um, and they were able to kill the gulls and eat the gulls. Um, and it actually saved that settlement. So the California gull is the state bird of Utah, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Do they go there often? Like no, they don't. So they very, very rarely actually ever go, if ever. Um, gulls nest on Anacapa Island, one of the Channel Islands out in the harbor. And you can see them anywhere, anytime. We even have one that comes and perches and like bangs on the window every once in a while. Um, the one that's most common that you'll probably see the most and you recognize is the western gull, that guy. Um, this is the California gull. So they're it's a little bit smaller, and then it's got a little bit of a different coloration, um, and that is the Utah state bird. And then you've got two other kinds that you'll see. This is Harriman's gull, and then Bonaparte's gull. Bonaparte's gull is the little one, like Bonaparte was little, okay? So Bonaparte's gull, Harriman's gull. Terns. Terns um, are a type of seabird that are going to be eating fish and small invertebrates. Okay, um, so they're actually not going to be like diving into the water as they try and um, capture food. They're just simply going to be like hovering there above the water. So they're actually going to spread their wings out and they rely on the wind that's already there um, and they're just going to kind of like glide right there and they keep their feet like right at the surface of the water or just in the water and so it actually looks like they're kind of walking on water um, as they are on top of the water. Um, and then they'll dip their head in in order to capture their prey. Uh, a couple different kinds of terns that are significant that you need to know something about. The Arctic tern is a tern that migrates from Antarctica to the Arctic and back every year. Um, that's a 22,000 mile round trip journey every year. That's really far. So uh, they, they do stop along the way and they do feed along the way, but that's a very, very far distance for them to go. Um, the least tern we find in California, and the least tern is um, endangered, just like the snowy plover, because it lays its eggs on the sand. And so when it lays its eggs on the sand, they get stepped on, and um, then you don't have new babies for the least tern. So they are an endangered species. Terns tend to be small and white, and then they've got these like black caps on their head. Okay. Um, and they have forked tails. So here's like the Arctic tern flying. You can see its forked tail. Okay, so this is the bird that's gonna do that crazy long migration. And so they start down here in Antarctica and they feed and then they migrate all the way up to the North Pole and then they lay eggs and mate and then they migrate all the way back down to Antarctica. Crazy, crazy far distance. Okay, um, and then this is the least tern and then there's its eggs on the sand so you can see how it blends in. Pelicans. Do you find pelicans here year-round? 
Uh, how many of you have ever been to the beach and seen pelicans? Hopefully most of you. Okay. Yeah, pelicans are all over. Um, <coughs> you find brown pelicans at the coast, and then you can see white pelicans at uh, like lakes and stuff like that. Okay. So white pelicans are found at lakes. They are going to dive into the water and then like scoop up fish from the water. Um, and they actually have this thing called a guller pouch underneath their lower jaw. So I w might write that down and remember it. It's a guller pouch, G-U-L-A-R. Okay, so they've got this pouch underneath their lower jaw, um, and they're going to dive into the water and like scoop up with that guller pouch a bunch of water and fish. Um, and their guller pouch actually holds about three times more than their stomach can hold, so they can't just like swallow all of that. So they actually sit on the surface of the water and they will squeeze that excess water out of their pouch and then swallow the fish. All right, so they um, will get their food that way. They um, also eventually, over time, go blind from the constant like diving into the water in order to get their prey. Um, pelicans were almost wiped out by the pesticide DDT. So DDT was a pesticide that was used like in the 60s and, and 70s and stuff. Um, and it was like everybody thought it was a miracle pesticide. So they sprayed it like on all the crops. It helped to keep all of the um, like bugs and stuff away from the crops. Uh, however, they found out it actually like causes cancer and stuff like that. So they stopped using it. But DDT does not break down. Um, and so they'd spray it on the crops and then it'd rain. And then the rainwater would wash all that DDT into the ocean. And as it gets into the ocean, it's going to um, cause all sorts of problems. So just like it causes, like, it's a pesticide, right? All these little insects, it causes a lot of other things to die in the ocean. And it gets um, absorbed into phytoplankton and then gets passed up the food chain through the process of biomagnification, which we talked about last semester, remember? Okay, so as you move up the food chain, you get an increasing dose of the toxin of DDT. And the pelicans were eating these fish that were full of DDT. And the way that it affected it um, affected the pelicans was it took their eggs and made interfered with the way that they make their eggs and made it so that the shell of that egg was super super thin. Okay, um, the way that pelicans uh, incubate their eggs are they lay their eggs and then they stand on them. Okay, because those shells were so so thin from the DDT, when the parents would go to incubate their eggs and stand on the shells, um, the shells would just like collapse and they'd crack their own eggs. So, um, like in the late 1960s, I think there was maybe one bird that was hatched and born uh, in the Channel Islands um, because of this huge problem with DDT. And it's still a problem because, like I said, DDT doesn't break down. It's settled out of the water, but now it's in the sediment. And so people, a lot of times, like if you disturb the sediment for like digging or whatever, um, that DDT gets back up into the water column and causes problems. So it's uh, it's not good. So here's what pelicans look like. So you can see them sitting on top of the water and then this one diving in. Um, and then two more pictures. Here's their, their breeding colony. Here's what their, their eggs look like. So here's what a healthy egg looks like. And then here's what was happening to the, um, the eggs because of the DDT. So they were being crushed by the parent. Cormorant. Another type of seabird. You'll see these around here. They're very, very common, like in the Ventura Harbor. They, I think they look like little mini Loch Ness monsters when they're in the water. Because they um, really, all you can see is like their neck. They've got this big, like long, curvy neck. And then they, they sink down in the water more than most other seabirds. Um, and so all you see is like a little bump on their back. And so they look like this like mini Loch Ness monster. So if you see something that looks kind of like a little Loch Ness monster, it's probably a cormorant. Okay. Um, cormorants are really, really good at swimming and diving. Okay. And they are going to pursue their prey underwater. You have half an hour. Um, they're going to pursue their prey underwater, and they're going to eat things like small fish. Okay. So um, that makes it, they're, they're super good at, at catching those little small fish. Um, they actually do not have feathers that are waterproof. So they, um, if you watch birds for any period of time, you'll see birds do this behavior, it's called preening, where they'll stick their 
their beak down by their tail, and then they'll rub their beak like over their feathers. Um, and what they're doing is they're taking oil from a gland that gets produced down by their tail and then spreading it over their feathers. And that makes the feathers waterproof. So that's why like ducks and stuff, they, you know, the water just rolls water off the duck's back, right? It just rolls off their back um, because their feathers are waterproof. Cormorants don't have that. Um, and so their feathers aren't waterproof. That's really good for them for diving because it's easier for them to dive and to get down into the, the water and chase their prey. Um, but it's bad for them because f when feathers get wet, they can't fly. Okay? They can't fly. So you'll see them like every so often they actually perch up on a rock and then they spread their wings out and they're like drying their wings um, be so that they can dry out their feathers and then fly away. So they, um, they can't fly right away. They're also used by fishermen in some Asian countries to, to fish, to get food, since they're such good fishers. Um, and so what they do is they train the cormorant to like go out and then come back to them. And they put a ring around the cormorant's neck so that the cormorant can't swallow the fish that it catches. So they'll send the cormorant out, catch the fish, they can't swallow it, they come back to the person, they take the fish, and then they send them back out. Now, they can take that ring off, right? And they do feed the cormorant because otherwise they would starve to death, right? But um, they use the cormorant to fish. So that's the uh, in poor areas that might be the only way that you can get get your fish. So here's what they look like. Um, here's the little mini Loch Ness monster, right? And then here's them drying up their wings and stuff. Here's them diving under the water in order to find their food. And then here's one being used uh, in China to find fish. Albatross. There's many species of albatross, but they are all found in the southern hemisphere. So they're all found around Antarctica. Okay. Um, so the reason why they're all found around Antarctica is because they must have wind in order to fly. Okay. Um, and because Around the southern hemisphere, okay, around Antarctica, there's no, you don't have like land masses. You have the southern ocean. So there's nothing really to interfere with the winds as it swirls around the South Pole. Um, and so there's very, very constant winds around the South Pole, which is good for the albatross uh, because they do have to have wind in order to fly. The reason why they have to have wind in order to fly is because they have a huge wingspan. So the wandering albatross has a wingspan that's like 11 and a half feet. So it has the largest wingspan of any seabird. So it's got this huge wingspan. Um, and you saw it in the couple of videos that we watched, right? Um, and so it's got this huge wingspan. So that big wingspan makes it very, very difficult and very inefficient to like flap its wings in order to fly. So it relies on gliding. And the only way that it can glide is if there's wind. So it's only found in the southern hemisphere. Um, they do spend most of their time gliding over the open ocean. Baby albatross or young albatross, well after they first hatch, they go out into the ocean and they will stay out at sea for like two years before they ever return to land. The only reason why these guys ever have to return to land is to reproduce and lay their eggs. So other than that, they'll spend all their time out to sea. Um, and then we looked at part of the myth of the albatross in the rhyme of the ancient mariner at the beginning of this cycle, right? At length did cross an albatross. Yes. Um, pictures. So here's an albatross compared to a human. So you can see the size. They're large birds. Here's an albatross egg compared to a chicken egg in a can of Coke. So you can see just how large those are. Um, and then here you have an albatross that is being banded. So the guy's like putting a little ring on its ankle so that they can track the albatross and stuff like that. Um, and then, so they're not scared of people. Um, and then here, this is so you can see them landing on the water, and then also like their wingspan. So you can see they have a large wingspan, right? And that's that's not even fully spread out. So, yeah, it's impressive. And then the penguin. I mean, we watched a couple of short video clips about the emperor penguin and the Adelie penguins and the chin strap penguins, um, but many different species of penguins. And again, they are all found in the southern hemisphere only in the southern hemisphere. Um, so how many of you have seen like the Coca-Cola commercials where you've got like penguins and polar bears like being friends? 
that doesn't happen. <laughs> um, penguins only live in the southern hemisphere, whereas polar bears only live in the North Pole. So polar bears and penguins are not friends. It's probably good for the penguins because the polar bears will probably eat the penguins. So it's probably good for them. So um, penguins are only found in the southern hemisphere. The farthest north that you will find a penguin is in the Galapagos Islands, okay, naturally. I mean, you can find them in zoos and stuff, but the, the natural habitat for them would be in the Galapagos Islands, and that's the farthest north. Um, they are the best adapted for life in the ocean, but that means that they can't fly. They do, like, fly underwater, though. So they're very, very good at swimming, um, and they have many, many adaptations to allow for them to swim. Uh, including like their feet being very far back on their body, which is good because as they're swimming through the water, those are good rudders to help them to steer. But it means that when they get up onto land, they're very awkward, right? And you get the little penguin-like waddle, okay, because of their feet being so far back. Um, they do what's called porpoising, where they actually like jump out of the water, um, like a dolphin would, right? And as they jump out of the water, they're breathing. So they jump out and breathe and then dive back in. And then they're gonna eat things like fish, krill, and squid, different pictures. So you got the emperor penguin. Here's our Adelie penguin. These two are the, ty the two types that are found in Antarctica all the time. Um, the Galapagos, or well, here's the chinstrap penguin, and then this one up here is the Galapagos penguin. Um, that's the one that's found just in the Galapagos. And that's a warm water penguin, warmer water penguin. Could okay? they survive 